All right, okay, so final speaker of today, Stephen Hall, and he's going to talk about 3D and 4D imaging of material structures and processes with X-rays and neutrons. Thank you. I guess I should apologize for standing between you all and uh, escaping to coffee. Um, but um, you can blame Melvin. Uh, <laughs> he asked me to come along and give you a bit of an update on what we're doing. Um, and I have... Uh, I'm collecting hats these days. I, I guess I'm here on, uh, with, with various hats on. One is in my role as a, a researcher at uh, Division of Solid Mechanics. Uh, another is uh, as leading the 4D imaging lab at the uh, X-ray tomography facility, and also as the director of LINX, the Lund Institute of Advanced uh, Neutron X-ray Science. Um, and I kind of want to update you on all of these, these aspects. Uh, Melvin was uh, uh, keen at sort of introduce LINX a bit in this forum because it does. Um, have connections to a lot, lot of things going on at compute. So I'm going to kind of go through a little bit what, we're, what we've been doing with 3D and 4D imaging with X-rays and neutrons, uh, including towards uh, current projects on dynamic imaging. And I'll also introduce a few um, structures we have that can relate to imaging and uh, X-rays and neutrons, and, and uh, perhaps <coughs> some of you will get involved. So <coughs> in our um, in my research, one of the tools I use a lot is uh, full field tomographic imaging. Um, I use it in my research and I also help a lot of other people use it in their research. And so in this sort of setup we have some sort of source, um, we have a, a sample which sits on a rotation stage and then we have a detector which records images of the transmitted um, radiation. Now <coughs> the source can be synchrotron uh, x-rays, it can be neutrons, it can be lab x-rays. Um, I even have a collaboration with a colleague working on a, uh, I think he's calling it kitchen tomography, uh, which involves a very bright uh, LED torch, a webcam and a Raspberry Pi rotating a stage. Uh, the principle's the same. In each case we acquire these uh, uh, radiographies as we rotate the sample, there's a mathematical reconstruction procedure and we come out with 3D uh, images which we can then analyse in different ways to, um, to extract information from these. Um, and so we're working a lot on really um, how we analyse these images, the 3D image analysis, also how these, when, when we look at the evolution of the sample with 3D imaging, we look at the 4D image analysis and how we can develop experiments to look at that 4D evolution. And we're actually moving back through this a little bit to, to some extent to circumvent the standard reconstruction procedures and go maybe direct from the raw data to the analysis. That's where I'll come to at the end. So one of our tools for this, um, rather than going to large scale facilities, we, we have a 4D imaging lab, uh, which is Lund University infrastructure, um, open to, to everyone. Um, and this is an X-ray tomograph or X-ray, uh, 3D X-ray microscope, if I were to call it, because it actually has a, um, a microscope set up on there, so we can zoom in and look at samples at different scales, from down you know, look, looking at things with uh, submicron resolution up to um, things the size of croissants, for example, uh, or bird feathers, or we, we look at a whole range of things. And so we're collaborating with people all over the university to look at different materials, and as I'll explain a little bit, one of the problems comes that we have a great bit of equipment, we have good knowledge of how to get these images, um, but the challenge is extracting the information. And there's two challenges there. One is the tools, having the right tools to do this, and the other is the right, uh, well, the, the, the people, getting people involved. So sometimes you get people acquiring images, but they don't have the knowledge to analyse these, but somebody else might have that knowledge. And that's part of the reason I'm here, is to talk a little bit. So to you guys to make you think, ah, perhaps you can get involved. Um, as I say, we're working with many different people. I mean, we, we're looking at uh, lots of things from archaeology and cultural heritage through to geology, uh, food science. Um, yeah, this is really a ballerina biscuit. Um, and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, lots of uh, materials examples related to, to wood and paper and whatever. Uh, uh, rocks, and uh, this is the, a slice to the head of a of um, a fly, I think that one was, rather than a bee, but we look at various things from biology. Um, so we got people from all backgrounds wanting to get something out of these images, and that's one of, one of our challenges. So we 
in terms of our data, just where we come from, so we, we acquire our, our radiographies at these uh, facilities. Um, we can acquire many of these data sets and reconstruct these into 3D volumes. And so then we get to the, the visualization aspect. We haven't got into uh, virtual reality yet, but um, this could be something that could be explored. Uh, these images, just a single one of these, but there's a multiple it's a 4D movie here, but each one is somewhere in the region of 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000 voxels. I don't know whether that's possible to go in and pluck out in virtual reality, but we can talk about that. And then, clearly, the quantification is a key part. So I want to talk a little bit about this and some of the, the current challenges. So we can take some, some of our examples. For example, this is a cellulose-based uh, foam. Um, it's, it's a foam structure with cells and uh, cell walls and we want to understand this structure and extract information from this that characterizes the structure. And this one's a rel relatively easy case. So we look at this rather than 3D, we look in uh, three orthogonal slices, then we can see the cells and the walls and what we want to do is extract information about, for example, the, the cells and what sizes they are. And this is a relatively simple image analysis technique, we use something called the uh, water well, binarization and watershed algorithm, you can segment this image into the individual cells and we can label them and once you've labeled them you can extract their characteristics. So you could look at the distribution of, of maximum minimum diameters for example. So that's fine, that's, that's something we can handle fairly easily and we, we, we do this in general uh, everyday way. Other materials are more complicated. Um, so this is a picture of uh, the material you have in your milk cartons for example. So these are paper fibers, um, and they're all a bit of a mess. They're kind of all over, they're oriented in different directions. Here you can see a cross section through a fiber. This is what we call the lumen in the middle, and this is actually this is the wood fiber. Um, and we want to be able to look at this material and extract information, say on the general porosity of the material, so how does the porosity vary with position, but also the structure of the fibers, the orientation of the fibers. But you see, the fibers aren't terribly consistent in their form. Some are open, some are closed. So this is a, this is a, a big challenge. There are people working on fibre segmentation, but those fibres are often just nice, long cylinders. And those are relatively straightforward, but this is a bit of a challenge. So we, we worked a little bit on this, uh, and we made some progress, but I'm just trying to provoke perhaps some response that people might want to play with this with us. So for example, we can, we, we've developed an approach where we want to try and identify these uh, lumina. I think that's the plural of lumen, anyway. Uh, and we do this, so we go through a procedure where we binarize the image into solid or um, uh, air. And then we can identify the lumina. And when we have these lumina, we reduce them down to single uh, marker points, indicating the, indi the, the, the center of these, these lumina in, in, a, in a 2D plane. And we do this in four 2D planes, four, um, 2D uh, four orientations of the 2D planes. And then we can put all of these together and we can get the medial axes of these and then we try to join together these, uh, these points into the medial axis and we have, then we can dilate out and get our fibre. So then we can then I go from our um, markers to the, the fibre and we can extract our fibre network. And I could stand here and tell you that this is a really good result because it looks quite convincing. There's lots of fibres there, but we're missing a lot of them and this is a fairly... Um, good example. So it's still not quite solved, it's a challenge. We can get a lot of the fibres but not all. And what we really want to do with this, we want to get all the fibres in a quite an automatic way and we want to look at this as we deform it for example. And we want to see what the fibres do and how they interact because then we can understand the deformation mechanisms in there. So this is ongoing work which is a bit of a fun challenge and I welcome uh, ideas from other people. Quite a different example where we're also having some challenges is, a w is work with Nick and Matt from uh, Biology. They're looking at different mutations of oats and barley seeds and they want, we're taking 3D images and we want to extract information about them. Now with some semi-automatic but quite a lot of manual intervention, um, a colleague has been able to extract out some of the main structures in here. And from this, we can work out volumes of these different structures and compare the different uh, mutations. 
But this is quite a classic sort of thing we'd want to be able to do is with your eyes, you're all saying, ah, I can see these shapes up here, I can see something here. You see a lot of stuff in this image. Now try telling that to the computer. Or try, try to get the computer to find those things is one of our challenges. And there's a, quite a, 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 a big subset of our imaging challenges which are along these lines. They're not nice morphological features like the foam and even the fibres are reasonably good morphological features. These are a little bit more challenging. It's stuff you can see with your eyes, but then you have to convince the computer to get it. Perhaps using some sort of texture analysis or maybe machine learning comes in here. I'm not sure. So this is, again, a little teaser to suggest anyone willing to come and play the game. We, we have some, some nice data to play with. So then, so that's a little bit of insight into what we're doing in 3D. So then we have our 4D uh, aspect. We call it the 4D Imaging Lab because the Lego man stands on the stage and runs and we take pictures of him. Oh, uh, it's a slight fake. This was uh, four images put together, each one taking about half an hour to acquire. But um, in reality what we're doing is interesting materials. And so we, we, we build stages which go on to this uh, rotation stage, either in our lab or in the synchrotron or in a neutron source. And we compress samples, we pull them, we peel them apart, apply vacuum, humidity, think of an experiment and we'll try and adapt it to our setup. And at different stages through the evolution of that uh, material in the setup, we will take 3D pictures and we will be able to make 4D movies, such as the one we've already seen, which is not 4D yet, there we go. So this is something like 50,000 grains of sand, which we have deformed in situ in a tomograph. And we can then make the 4D movie to see how this um, deforms, see how the material evolves. And then we want to go in and understand the mechanisms that lead to what you see here, this localization of the deformation and the failure of the whole sample. So this has been work we've, we've been doing for many, many years. Um, and we have, have developed systems or, or analysis procedures where we can look at the evolution of porosity, so a sort of n times 3D analysis. We can do something called digital image correlation, where we track different parts of the, of the, uh, of the image in, in three dimensions, and we get the kinematics uh, of, of the, uh, the kinematic field of the materials, we can get the uh, displacement fields and strain fields. So we get, uh, we're able to characterize that the material failed by a localized failure of, uh, of a, localized, a localization of the strain. And, uh, and we can even then go in and look at the individual grains and see how they, they rotate. So this is something we've established and, and it's, it's quite common in, 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 um, in our work now. We'd like to do the same thing with the fibers or for other materials. Um, and we've also taken this out and we, we use it in, with neutrons as well. So we can do the similar things with neutron imaging. This is a, uh, actually an artificial rock sample, not a real rock sample, but an artificial sample that we then, we, we deformed in situ in, with neutron imaging and we're able to then, by this image correlation technique, get the strain field out. So as I said, it doesn't matter really with x-rays or neutrons. We've got a set of images that we can then analyze and get the strain fields. And this shows that this sample failed by this localized shear deformation, which had a very complex 3D pattern. Now, one of the things we actually use neutrons for is not necessarily for structural imaging. This is looking at the structure and the structural evolution. Neutrons are very good for detecting hydrogen uh, in materials. And so we actually like using neutrons for following things like uh, fluid flow in rocks or in, in samples. So this is a deformed rock sample. This is a radiography, radiographic projection through a sample as we flow water through. And so we can follow this fluid front up through the material and we can find that there's certain paths it prefers to take. There's this general front, but then it's going up this part here. And so that's actually where there's a deformation uh, region. And this is work which I did, ooh, I'm not sure, it published in 2013, this was a while ago. Um, and we, we took this and we were able to quantify to a certain extent the flow velocities in the material and, and understand how the deformation evolved the the flow. Now we just had a PhD student defend recently who has extended this work to three dimensions. So now we're, we're spinning the sample fast enough, we're doing, I think it was one minute tomographies, and we're, doing, we're, we're following the waterfront up through a deformed uh, sample, doing a tomography as it goes, the flow is slow enough that we're able to then extract the fluid front uh, in three dimensions um, as it rises through the material. 
So we're able to see the shape of this front. So we're actually able to look at it in three dimensions, which is more correct. And then we could link this to the, to the deformation. So we, we, we go through, we take, we do this analysis, we can get the velocity field from the, from the fluid front um, uh, advance, and we can work out that there's a certain area where the, the water goes faster, higher velocities, and we can compare that to our image correlation for deformation and find out that these zones where it's going faster is actually where we have these localized deformation. Okay, that's, so that's great. So we're, we're, we're able to follow the evolution of materials in four dimensions, uh, in both structurally and, in this case, um, hydraulically. We see how the, f the fluid advances. But sometimes things go too fast. So the process there with the water flowing, we were able to do images in about one minute, and that was okay. We could follow the front fairly well. But not all processes, uh, processes go slow enough to image uh, like that. And so what if it goes faster? Well, you could, you, could, you could rotate your sample faster. Now, Raymond de is not here at the moment, but his solution is to, to be able to spin his sample at 150 hertz and so therefore do 300, 300 hertz uh, tomographic imaging. Not everything likes being spun around quite so quick. Uh, it does affect the mechanics, particularly if you've got fluids in there. So it's not necessarily the best approach. And so what we've actually been looking at a lot in, in recent years is adapting the imaging protocol and, and the image analysis to um, be able to acquire data, and not, a full, not say a full tomography, but acquire data uh, at whatever speed you can um, and follow the process based on a slightly more intelligent image analysis. So if we actually go back, th this is actually um, the, the fluid flow example I showed you where we, we had the, the 3D front. Uh, and I said we acquired tomographies in a minute and we were able to reconstruct those. In reality, over our one minute, the rotation up by 180 degrees, the front moved forwards. So it's not, strictly speaking, a static front during our tomographic uh, reconstruction. And so this is the difference between the two, and you can see there's a region there where, there's a diff um, where there's, uh, the, the images don't quite match. So it is moving. So, um, actually, it wasn't exactly the same example, it was a, a similar one. But we were able to do the reconstruction because it's not moving by that much. And we can follow the front, and it's not getting too deformed. So we could do this. But we came up with an alternative approach by, uh, with a colleague, uh, Clément Gélin, from uh, LMT Cachon in France, uh, where instead of doing this, what we would do is we would come up with a model for this advancing front, the, the shape of the front and the height of the front, so a, a series of time-space functions, which describe what the front would look like. And then we would predict the projection. So we could predict the projection at zero degrees and 180 degrees, but also every angle in between. So we have a, a model of the advance over the, the time of this rotation of the sample. And we adjust the time-space functions to, uh, to, the, to um, minimize the difference between our predicted projections and the, and the data projections until we got a good fit. So it's an iterative approach. And we're able, at the end of it, to come out with, I mean, there's a couple of slices at uh, two different times during the rotation, but we're able to come out with the shape and the height of the front based on skipping the, the back projection reconstruction and going to a model-based inversion where we predict what the projections look like and just matching on those. And we even found, I, I didn't actually have the result from this, but we, we, um, we actually found that throughout the whole series of the experiments, we could just take random projections at any time step and we could, get, uh, we could back out the 4D evolution of the front without using all the data. We just take a few projections um, um, at, uh, a few time steps as long as they're distributed in time and rotation and we're able to reconstruct how, how the, th the front evolves through time. So this is kind of nice. So we're basically working on model-based inversion approaches now, and this can help you in, in many different uh, uh, areas. There are some things which go even faster, and this is where we've, um, where we've got to at the moment. Um, we now have a project going on with um, colleagues here in Lund and in um, at the European Exfel and also in Berlin, where we're trying to look at dynamic processes. So we're talking about things in this 100 nanoseconds uh, time scale. So like this, where well, this is work from, from others, but you see this dynamic breakage of, of grains. And we want to be able to capture this 
information. But and this is done. This has been done before. Very fast imaging uh, with a synchrotron, and you capture this the evolution of this process in two dimensions. But we want three dimensional information. And okay, so the here this is going pretty fast already. If we go to the XFL, you're going even faster. Uh, basically, we have a what is it? A 4.5 megahertz repetition rate. Now, if you want to get tomography in that time, um, you're going to spin quite fast, especially since the process is happening over hundreds of nanoseconds. That's not possible. Well, I shouldn't say it's not possible. It doesn't seem like a reasonable thing to try and do. Um, so the idea instead, what we would like to do is to take our incoming beam, in incoming uh, X-ray beam, either synchrotron or um, uh, free electron, uh, uh, the X-ray uh, free electron laser, uh, and split it with a crystal, so just by, by Bragg splitting. And then we somehow reflect it back in and it, uh, these beams would then traverse the sample at different angles and then we collect them on the other side. Now we can do that with um, just splitting the beam into two plus a direct beam or we could use the um, octoscope as we seem to be calling it now which has eight beams plus the direct beam and so we get these multiple views on, on, the, um, on the sample for every, uh, every shot. So it's just multiple radiography, we're not rotating the sample. And so what we're working on now, or the project's really just starting now, is how can we extract 3D information from this setup to be able to follow dynamic processes in three dimensions at uh, megahertz frame rates. And the ideas are building on what we've done already, some model-based inversions. What one approach could be at the synchrotron where you have the liberty of rotating your sample first and getting a 3D image, then all you need to do is propose some sort of kinematic updating of the model and predicting what the projections would look like. And then this angular information will be enough to capture the, the kinematics to a certain extent. There are also approaches which uh, ha uh, have relations to uh, fluid dynamics um, experiments where you do uh, speckle velocimetry. So you're looking at the statistics of the speckle pattern. And this is already exploited in, in some, um, some areas already. Uh, so we're working on the new algorithms for 3D reconstruction and uh, also working with things to, with phase retrieval, the X-ray phase retrieval, which will give us an additional bit of information. So this is where, the, where we're having fun at the moment. Okay, so just to, f just to finish off, move away from sort of the science slightly and towards some of the things I'm working on which facilitate science uh, around, um, around this area. So I just want to inform you of some of the things going on uh, at the moment. So we have a few projects. One is called KIM. I'm not sure whether it's been talked about in this forum, but this is the Centre for Quantification of Imaging Data from Max4. This was initiated originally by DTU and KU, but uh, with Max4 and now Lund University, Lund University is a partner in this. And the idea is that this will be a centre that provides support for um, particularly tomographic image analysis. And we will be recruiting a um, application expert, you might call them, to establish um, a, a Lunark desktop, basically, towards imaging, towards 3D image analysis, with uh, frameworks for analyzing different types of data and support, so to hold the hands of users a little bit to get them through their data analyses, and to help build the community so we have a larger critical mass um, around this, uh, this area. So this is uh, in the startup phase at the moment and we should be recruiting somebody very soon, I hope, to, to run this on, on the Lund side. Another thing that I've been asked to look into uh, is, yeah, is establishing um, Lund University Imaging Centre. Well, we can think about the name, what the name might be. But the idea is to try and coordinate many of the activities to do with imaging in Lund in particular around volumetric or tomographic image uh, analysis. Uh, that involves this KIM project I just mentioned. Lunark would be a major factor of this. And then with the data coming from the large scale facilities, the lab facilities, not, not just my lab, but other labs, 
Um, and we're just starting this up, and it was very good to have this community involved with this. Now we'll change hats again, just a final bit, is links. So for those of you who haven't heard of links, so this is the London Institute of um, Advanced Neutron and X-ray Science, which is motivated by, motivated by this picture here, in which we have Max 4, VSS, and eventually this hotly debated bit of ground called Science Village Scandinavia. Um, and Lund University will be moving out here. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people coming in to use these facilities. And Lynx aims to be one of the main focuses for bringing these communities together around Max 4 and ESS and Lund University and also nationally and internationally. So that Lynx will be the thing that brings these communities together in Lund. So bringing Lund University into this community, but also the people visiting Max 4 and ESS, bringing them into interactions with uh, other researchers, both from Lund and for, uh, from elsewhere in Sweden. So it's an advanced studies institute. I've already heard uh, something about it this morning from Sonia, uh, with a focus on uh, using X uh, science using X-rays and neutrons. We're developing an internationally, uh, internationally recognised program for visiting researchers, focusing on X-ray and neutron-based research, We're bringing to the experimentalists, theoreticians, simulators, um, and building these networks and trying to uh, provide the forum for pushing things forward. Currently, we have three themes, imaging, dynamics, and integrative structural biology. And we're organizing events and working groups within these. Uh, to give you a flavour for what this means, we've had various events so far this year. We've got a working group on geology, archaeology and cultural heritage studies and they're looking at how they can exploit X-ray and neutron imaging to look at their, um, their materials. I borrowed something from Melvin, really, or from this community, the hackathons. Uh, we've had hackathons on image analysis, the next one's coming up, I'll tell you about it in a moment. Uh, we've had workshops on different aspects of X-ray and neutron science. Coming up, there's a whole bunch of different events. Next week, there's one on magnetism. Uh, there's a few schools and different partner events. Um, I don't want to swamp you all that, so I'll focus on the ones which are most interesting, perhaps, for this, this group. There's uh, an upcoming event on imaging of biological tissues. We have a very much mathematical, is it, uh, 4D Maths Day was the name before we had to give it something more official, um, where we're looking at inverse problems in phase retrieval and tomography. The next hackathon is the 20th, 22nd of April, looking more towards biological problems. There's a working group really starting up after the summer on simulation theory and software development for anisotropic, I think you should say scattering there, there seems to be a word missing. And we have the biocompute group, which is already mentioned, ESCO leading it up, and Sonia mentioned it this morning. So with that, I will just say, please get involved. Um, look at the website, find out what's going on, talk to me, talk to ESCO, um, and it'd be great to have more people from this community uh, involved because there's a lot of compute challenges uh, related to this area of science. So, thank you. Time for coffee. Okay, thank you. Questions for Stephen? So in the very end, you mentioned uh, imaging of biological tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, could you do that with your um, octal laser, so to speak, to mm -hmm. do a 4D image, or will it just blow up uh, after shining the laser or synchrotron on it? Um, I, I guess I'm not the expert on the, uh, on the uh, biological tissues. Uh, and yeah, people, a lot of the stuff with the x is actually based around looking at cells and things. You generally kill them as you do it. Uh, I guess if we, um, with the octoscope, uh, maybe there is a chance to see something, but I think most of the XFL stuff, you're killing it and then finding out what happens, you know, what you scatter off it. Um, I'm not sure. We're, we're focusing on uh, materials to start off with. They're a bit less sensitive. Um, but we, we, the idea is we hit, we'll hit it many times. We'll use many parts of the, uh, the pulse to see this evolution. And I would imagine that most biological tissues will die at the first pulse. So there won't be much 4D about it, but I don't know. 
But the 4D imaging of biological stuff we do, but you know, much slower sense in synchrotrons and in the lab sources, that's that's fine. Um, any further questions? Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what is your interaction with the electron uh, imaging community? I mean, you have X-rays, neutrons, why not electrons in the same? Um, depends which hat I put on. Uh, so Lynx is focused towards X-rays and, and neutrons, uh, but with an interest, obviously, in the complementary techniques. That should be part uh, of No, I was more referring to the... Uh, the, the 4D imaging. Yeah, I was going to go back through, through yeah. them all. Uh, so then there's also the imaging centre and the imaging community. So there are s there's some good developments on the side, more towards electron microscopy. Uh, and they've actually got funding for somebody to help with image analysis of that. And then if I take a step back to my own research, then um, mostly what I do is large, fairly dense materials. And so um, electron methods have not yet been uh, um, of interest. Uh, and a lot of the electron microscopy is obviously in two dimensions. Now you can do the, the tomographic uh, approach and it's not so well, um, uh, it's not so available and it's not really a scale I generally look at. But yeah, absolutely. A lot of the stuff that we do with, the X, with, with x-rays um, has been also applied to electron microscopy and um, yeah. Maybe one day I'll have need to do need, need to use it, but I use whichever tool is appropriate for what I do. I mean, I just talked about X-ray neutrons today, but but I also do a lot of stuff on. Uh, I've done a lot of stuff on ultrasound in the past using ultrasonic tomography, which is more appropriate in certain areas. So uh, I'm not stuck on one tool. It's probably best. It, it's probably what you're you're getting at. It's, it's it's bad to have a tool and hit everything with it. You should try and find the right hammer for the right job. So, yeah. So at some point you show the pipeline of, uh, uh, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, so I can refer to I don't to know if I can go back either, let's see, yeah. what, see what happens. Uh, so the data flow or something, yeah. that one, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess this, maybe, is it that? No, no. Uh, there was one that does the vertical sign. Uh, oh, late on, this one here maybe? Yes, that yeah. one. Okay, so the, the question for an outsider of this uh, kind of max four analysis because i don't know how much how long they take is uh, is this kind of feedback here useful for someone not to have not to find out when they go home and they look at their data that they've made a mistake somewhere or is it something different I mean, are there, yeah, maybe I the question is more general. I guess, yes, it's something different, and yes, it's what you first said. Uh, so the idea is we want to, uh, the problem, what happens really, even in our lab facilities, people come and acquire data. That's the easy bit. Uh, then you've got the step of reconstruction. Now, usually that's an easy bit as well. Sometimes it gets delayed. Um, but then what you often get, and I've had this many times, is somebody goes home with their images, they get hold of a visualization package, and they look at it. Oh, lovely isn't it and then shortly after it's lovely isn't it but it's useless um, because they can't get something out of it and and then maybe they start to develop the quantification if they're lucky they can extract inf interesting in, in, uh, information and and hopefully that, that's good then they've got some of the answers they want but with the other part you said that often they go oh I've quantified it now and I've, it's not what I wanted or I wish I had more. So what we're, what we're trying to do is set up the possibility for people to, first of all, analyze their data, even if it's once they've gone home, so they get something useful out of it. They don't, stick, they don't get stuck on the, oh, what a pretty picture, oh. Uh, so they can actually get something nice and you know, something scientific out of it, not just artistic, one might say. Um, but if we can do this on the beam line, even at initial st state, then that's even better because then you can have the feedback. You can you can inform your experiment as you go along. Um, so that's why is that basically both parts of what you said is what we're after. We want to be able to do this on the beam line uh, or at the facility wherever and come up with answers that you can then say, mm, uh, maybe I should actually change my experiment. That, and if we can start to do that, that would be the first facility uh, in the world really doing it on that level. I think that's the objective. Okay, and with that, uh, we'll conclude for the day. Let's thank Stephen again.